Ladies and gentlemen, dear talents, a warm welcome again. It's great to be your host again. I'm coming in and out this afternoon and I'm happy to see so many people, I think even up to this upper balcony. Thank you very much for joining. This session is now within the framework of the Drama Series Days and as you probably know that's uh, something that we do together with the festival, together with the European film market and uh, it is because there is an immense interest in the meantime on Drama Series, not only for those who are doing it but also for those who are doing film, I heard just classical film sometimes, uh, So, but uh, because uh, you can learn a lot and you can extend a lot about how you do storytelling how you do it, how you do production. And so we are happy to include this within the framework of our program. And this session has a special dedication as well because it's also dedicated to cinematography and it's dedicated to wonderful series and many other things. And I'm very happy now to introduce you to the moderator. Uh, he's knowing this place very well and he's now coming from the stage of business, so the European film market. Please welcome the director of the European film market, Matthijs Wouter Knoll. Good afternoon, great to see all of you coming to this very special series and thank you Florian for introducing uh, the series which is in the framework a set of the drama series days, the highlights of drama series from all over the world and this year at Talents an opportunity to not only look at those series and get a feeling of what those new series will be for the next years but also to have a feeling of how these series are made. We focus today on I think one of the series that has reached like an enormous amount of people all around the world. I think most of the people are waiting for the next season, the six seasons, to start later on in April. Um, so we focus today, need not say more, Game of Thrones. We're very lucky today because we have uh, not only one expert, but actually two experts. When the experts heard that one of the DOPs will be joining us today, uh, one of the other DOPs said, like, I actually want to join because I want to talk about it as well. I'm going to introduce them to you. First of all, we have Fabian Wagner, who is a German-born cinematographer, who has actually been working on quite some British TV series before. He's also based in, in London, um, before w uh, working on Game of Thrones. So he worked, for example, on Robert Carlyle's BAFTA-winning Barty Thompson, or Paul McGigan's Victor Frankenstein. He was nominated twice for a Primetime Emmy Award for his work on Sherlock and also for Game of Thrones. And he's joined today by Jonathan Freeman from Canada, uh, also nominated for quite some awards, worked on TV movies, and also worked with Steven Spielberg on the miniseries Taken. He has um, done quite some other shows, including, and I have to read those ones because they're quite a number, Rescue Me, Rome, Sons of Anarchy, and Damages. And his uh, extensive work of Game of Thrones and also on Boardwalk Empire uh, got him three primetime Emmys and five ASC awards. So we have people who know what they are talking about, are very, very experienced in working on series, and we're going to ask them everything. You can ask them everything. And please, a warm welcome for Fabian Wagner and Jonathan Freeman. Welcome to both of you. We have a chance to actually learn a lot. I'm sure that most of the people in the audience know Game of Thrones quite well. Uh, let's do a quick test. Who has seen all the seasons so far of Game of Thrones? There's, there's also people sitting upstairs, even in the second balcony, so it's full. Um, that means we know a lot about your work, we see your work. Um, I think that's a luxury that not always happens with people sitting on the stage. And I'm quite curious, and I think most of the people here as well, to know a little bit about how you guys are working, how you got to work for Game of Thrones, but also I think everybody realizes, and I think that's quite clear, with the, the whole range of stories being told within the series, with all the different locations, with the huge crews that you're working on, and also the huge budgets, I think uh, it would be great if you could share a little bit uh, in the next 90 minutes about how you guys manage to do that and how you keep us sitting on the tip of our chair to watch the next seasons because you're a part of that. Jonathan, maybe we can start with you. Um, maybe you can say something just to start with. How did you, how did you start working on Game of Thrones? What brought you to the team? Um, uh, well, I had worked on a number of 
uh, HBO projects before. I, I was working on Boardwalk Empire and uh, also uh, Rome. Um, and some of the people involved in Game of Thrones were working on the first season. Uh, when second, the second season came about, they were looking for uh, uh, other uh, cinematographers to come in to, uh, to jump uh, forward. And um, my name was presented, and I was lucky to to uh, to get a spot in in the, in the, the team. And um, yeah, it, it was it's, I guess through previous connections, I I uh, was able to get the opportunity. So um, they that means basically you 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 got involved. Um, did it mean that in the beginning you were working like? on a number of episodes, or did it like increase, or how does it work? Because there's, there's quite a number, you're not the only two DOPs of, of Game of Thrones. How many people are you guys working with when it comes to the DPO team? Uh, well, uh, each season has had various no, uh, numbers of DPs um, based just on uh, scheduling and whatnot. Uh, typically the way our seasons break down now is that we may have as many five cinematographers who work with a director and an AD, or probably more appropriately said, a uh, director who has a cinematographer and an AD that works with them, uh, shooting two episodes. Um, and uh, uh, that way, there's a consistency within uh, communication in terms of pre production, and uh, basically, that three group of three will prep together and move around together between two different units that are shooting simultaneously. Um, and uh, it, the, it's, a, it's a very unique uh, schedule and very impressively done by uh, Chris Newman, one of our producers, uh, who manages to, along with Bernie Caulfield, uh, who's also one of our other producers, to, to uh, schedule between uh, different countries, different set pieces, different actor availabilities, uh, and um, somehow make it all work. And when you first see a schedule, it's the most mind-boggling thing you'd ever seen because it's all color coordinated. So each team has a certain color, and then that, you know, it basically has a schedule, like a calendar, uh, where uh, your color is indicated what scene you might be shooting or scenes you might be shooting in one day. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's basically a very mosaic map that it looks very confusing at first, but it's intimidating actually at first. So it's a bit, it's a bit like the dine and shine system. Actually, you have yeah. colors and you move to different places. It's like an event that would happen um, like two days ago with also tables and colors. Yeah. Um, we're, we're, we're going to watch quite some content actually of Game of Thrones. But before we start um, throwing some clips into the room, Fabian, maybe you can say something about how you joined um, the Game of Thrones gang. Sure. sure. Um, <clears throat> I. Um I actually have got no idea how I got into the show. Um, I was shooting in Canada on a pilot, and I suddenly had a phone call from my agent saying that David and Dan, David Benio from Dan Weiss, um, want to have a chat. And uh, I mean, what, what happened was basically they really liked my episode of Sherlock, um, which that was the one I was also nominated for for an Emmy. So that was great because it exposed me to the states um, a little bit more and. Um, so yeah, I had a Skype chat with them for about 10 minutes, and at the end they said, we'd love you to come and shoot. So I, I started season four and, and have been there since, since then. So there is, um, I know there's one other German member as well of the DOP team, Annette Helmig. Um, mm -hmm. Is there other like, like European people, a lot of European people on like, the DOP team? I mean, I know it's like, quite a mixture and a very international mix of people uh, working on that series. The Canadians are very strong, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's a kind of unusual uh, combination of Canadians and Germans. Uh, this sort of happened that way, but um, there's no reason for that. There's no, it's not a, a co-production for companies. There's no um, economical reason. It's just a certain, it just kind of fell in that way. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it's, I don't know, it's pretty well evenly represented, I think, is, you know, a, a number of um, uh, British or Irish uh, DPs who've worked as well on the project. And, uh, and I think it's less about where, where we all come from. I think it's more of a 
personality, everybody's very similar, um, which I think is very important for the producers of the show and also for us. Um, so. I mean, it's an interesting thing because apart from the crew, I think being very um, international, even though there's a highlight in Canadians and Germans working on the show, um, also when you look at the pool of actors, which is extremely international, but still, um, I think Game of Thrones is one of the examples where it's managed quite well to create a consistent look um, when it comes to the locations, when it comes to the atmosphere uh, of the different parts of the Seven Kingdoms. Uh, but also when it comes to the actors, each of them having their own accents, which actually is perfectly logical if you're, if you're aware of the fact that we're talking about a huge uh, piece of, uh, of the world, I guess. Um, that's also a topic that we're going to talk about because I think when we think about all those locations uh, and the different uh, people being or be ruling those places or fighting each other or whatever they're doing in these places, we can actually recognize already in the first shot, I would say, or with the light that we see, we know we're either in the north or in the south or wherever we are. Um, that's something I think that specifically relates to the work you are doing, and I think in the level of storytelling and, and guiding people through this very complex uh, string of, of stories, um, light, cinematography, um, location, locations, um, is extremely important. Let's maybe start watching with a clip. So based on the clips that we can see, we can like, pick some of these topics, and uh, I'm sure you'll have some questions at some point about that as well. Let's watch the first clip, which is um, Jonathan, I think from the second season. Um, yeah, it's, it's, um, I think it's the season finale of episode, or season two. Um, uh, and it's uh, Daenerys um, walking through a throne room. It's actually part of a sequence that's a, uh, somewhat, a, almost like a dream-like sequence uh, when she is sort of, uh, being interrogated by, um, I've forgotten the, the character's name anyway. There's so many characters to remember. Jesus. We'll um, help you. Yeah, yeah. but uh, anyway, this is actually just part of that sequence. So, so uh, let's, uh, let's watch a clip. Jonathan, can you say something about, um, where, I mean, this is probably a different location, but can you say something about where this was shot and what of it is visual effects and what you actually shot? Uh, sure, this is actually uh, uh, our standard throne room that we've had since uh, the pilot episode. Um, and in fact, it was an inherited set, I believe, that was retrofitted for the, the show. Um, and it's shot in Belfast, as m most of our interior spaces are shot. So it's a standard set, but as you can see in the, in the sequence clip, of course, there's a, a ceiling that doesn't exist or is, you know, um, uh, it's a, sort of destroyed somewhat. So uh, the actual set itself is, of course, only maybe two-thirds of what you see in the frame, and then we, they did a, a visual effects extension on, on it. So um, part of the process for um, that sequence was that the throne room itself had never been sort of lit in a cool tone uh, or, or sort of... Um, uh, winterly tone, if you will, um, before, obviously for obvious reasons, because it's set in King's Landing, which is this very warm climate, and tonally we've always kept that to feel very warm. Uh, often, you know, having shafts of light coming through windows and very different look to it. So this was, um, you know, uh, the, the photographic inspiration of it is simply just to kind of convey that there's actually uh, that not only uh, sort of a winter setting, but, um, but you know, the ceiling has caved in. So I just had to kind of reshape the light in order to kind of get that feeling, I guess. And maybe also, I mean, you, you when you start shooting, I mean, you read the script, um, you talk with the directors about what, what he or she is intending to do. Is there female directors on Game of Thrones? I'm actually not sure. Is there, is there any female directors on Game of Thrones? Uh, sorry, there, are there? Kids? What was the question? No, if there's any female directors oh, on Game of Thrones. Um, I don't really see ma men's names, but... Michelle McLaren. Yeah, um, right, yeah, Michelle. Yeah. Yeah. 
So you get a script, you talk with the director on it. Um, there is, it's quite clear, especially when you join, for example, in your case, Fabian, in the fourth season, that there is this whole setting, this whole like visual language that people relate to, that we know, that we need to know. We see where we are, we recognize this, 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 this location within um, uh, the world of the series. How do you, as a cinematographer, how do you add things to that, or how do you come up with ideas? Um, how is that process going between you and the directors? Is it pretty straightforward because you know which sort of like formula, with all respect, you have to, to shoot? Um, well, one thing I would say about the, this sequence is that uh, the, uh, the fact that we, we never framed uh, the ceiling before in, 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 up until that point because uh, we, were, we never were, had a limited budget. You couldn't you know, build the set extensions and the, if the story didn't demand it, there was no need for it. So that sequence would have been the first time we have seen the ceiling. <clears throat> um, and then I was working with uh, Alan Taylor, who was the director, and we discussed this. And we realized that there's an opening sequence uh, in the throne room um, uh, where Tywin comes in in a horse and, and whatnot. And we realized that we had to find out a way to show the ceiling that there was a ceiling that existed because in the language of the show it's it's important that you know you understand that there's a ceiling and then it essentially is destroyed so so something like that will come up in in a discussion and and it may not be on the page but then we would implement it in shooting fabian before we go to the next clip that you uh, have been shooting uh, can you say something about how uh, before we watch that clip how you have been working with the director on um, that specific scene and how you um, sometimes also added maybe new nice things to what was written in the script or is that not really much the case? I mean, I mean you always, <clears throat> you know, obviously before you start you talk to the director and come up with, with, you know, various ideas that will hopefully work to, you know, help the storyline. I mean, the, the, I think this next clip is set in the audience chamber and I mean, what happened with that, with that particular scene was that I, you know, because we always, all of us are crossing over, we all, we all shoot obviously in the same locations for our episodes. And even though we're obviously trying to have a coherent look throughout the whole show, you know, we're all very different. Um, not only German and Canadian, but also <laughs> creatively different, you know. Um, so each of us, I think, has a, you know, certain approach to things, um, which we all sort of try and um, do in the work that we do. And, and for me, that scene was, because I, I, in season four, I lit that set, I think, first, because I had the first, there was a new set built for season four, and um, because I was the first one shooting in there, so I kind of was the first one to light it. Obviously, we all talked about it beforehand. And then when it came to season five, I thought, you know, I really wanted to do something different at that point, so I actually keyed it from the other side, which totally doesn't make sense because uh, it doesn't actually work because there's no windows, but I thought I just wanted to mix it up a little bit. And it also felt, for that scene, it would be nice to start that um, episode with a slightly different approach. So we're seeing a scene which I think is shot in Marine, where uh, Daenerys is basically residing and uh, uh, welcoming guests uh, and basically ruling from this like huge... Yeah, yeah so the top it? of a pyramid, it's, the, it's called the audience chamber. Exactly, yeah. So let's see the scene shot in Marine by Fabian. Um, we referred to a little bit already to the different locations where you're shooting. You mentioned um, Ireland, where, where uh, things are being shot. Um, the other ones, I know there's being shot in Croatia as well. I think Dubrovnik is like, like the set of uh, King's Landing, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, which are the other locations? I'm sure many of people will know which are the locations that you're shooting at uh, normally for like a, a regular episode. Well, I think, I think you started in, I think uh, season two was Morocco, right? So, uh, you know, I mean, yeah, season two was Morocco, then I think in season three you moved to um, Croatia, which then became sort of the main set for the south. Um, Dubrovnik split, and we were also shooting in Sibenic um, for a few, few locations. And then last year we actually went to Spain. And, um, and then Iceland was quite a main part. Yeah, um, we, we also shot Iceland, I guess, in season 
two, two, three, and four, four. I think. Yeah. <clears throat> um, actually, in the summer, in, in uh, season four, which is interesting, a different look, but um, and that was fantastic to do. Um, uh, and yeah, I, I guess the desert locations had varied from country to country. So it was actually Malta, I think, in this first season, and then uh, and actually Morocco in, in season three as well. So quite quite a few. Is there any new locations being added for the sixth season that we don't know about? A new country you could be you could travel to to shop, or is it you're not allowed to say? <laughs> <laughs> well. So. Belfast and Spain generally, so nothing, nothing new to report there. Okay, good. Um, just talking about like the, the amount of, well, maybe influence, not the right word, but the creativity you can add to the, the written um, um, uh, scripts. I mean, I know that we're, we all know that George um, R. R. Martin is, like, the, the series is based on the books, um, but the books are not going as quick or not as quickly written as the series is actually uh, proceeding. So in the meantime, I think this, I'm not sure if this was the fifth, but the sixth season I know is based not on the books anymore, but it is based on actually probably half of the book and the rest of the scripts that he has been, uh, been involved in. Does that change in some way the way you work? Is, does it give you more liberty because like, there's, there's no book, there's only the script, or it doesn't really make a difference for you? I don't think it makes a difference. To us, I think, I mean, you know, the, the great thing with Game of Thrones is that it's such a well-written show. I mean, the writing is so tight and it's so well done. <clears throat> Personally, actually, I've never, I've never read the books, I have to admit. Um, so, you know, and there's so much visual opportunity within what's already on the page of the script, so it doesn't really affect us, I think, as an autographist. Um, I'd like to continue straight away with the next clip. So we have, like, we have five clips in total. So we'll have seen it by half of the session, and then we can continue with some other questions as well. And next, uh, next um, clip, Jonathan, is something you shot uh, together with Nicolas um, Costa Waldau, Danish actor, mm -hmm. playing uh, Jamie Lannister. That's right. um, it's said in a small room, and it appears to me that when we're talking about visual effects, which we'll come back to later on as well, um, many of the big scenes, including like the, the wall in the north, so to say, where we just saw Daenerys coming through, is like a lot of visual effects. I'm not sure where that location would be and would exist in the world. Um, can you say something about the room scene that we're going to see now? Because that's shot by you, and it, it, of course, creates a very different atmosphere. How did you prepare that scene, and, and, and what were you paying attention to when making that together with the director? Uh, yeah, so this is a scene between uh, Ty Tywin Lannister and his son, Jamie Lannister. Uh, this is, I guess, uh, I think his first episode of season four. And uh, Jamie's lost his hand. Um, and has returned uh, finally after a, a season and a half, I think, almost of on the road, to say so, so to speak. Um, and uh, it's, it, he's being uh, offered um, uh, a very special sword, which is uh, basically a, a sword that was melted down into two swords from uh, the sword of Ned Stark, which was. Uh, significant because it's made of valerian steel. So, um, and it's a pretty simple, you know, kitchen sink scene, to be honest. <laughs> but it's, it's great to see these actors perform. So, let's watch the third clip, please. Jonathan, I think um, this scene also raises another question. Uh, we're, we're talking about a world where there is hardly any electric light. Um, so how, I think with this scene it's quite particular, I mean, there's a lot, you do a lot with light, but the, the rooms are quite dark normally as well. Um, how, do you, uh, how do you work on that and how, how can you say something maybe using this scene on how, you, how you're working that basically uh, during the series and shooting the series? Yeah, um, well, uh, we, as cinematographers, sort of uh, do arrive similarly on the, the basic approach. You know, if we um, always want to motivate light if we can. Uh, so, depending on our 
scenes that we're, we're uh, supposed to shoot, uh, particularly interiors. It's either going to be daylight interiors, uh, you know, uh, or night interiors. Um, uh, we sort of have a kind of a, a rule that we kind of try and apply. Sometimes we we kind of break it a little bit, but um, to uh, to limit the amount of candlelight uh, and also just for a look, um, it was requested from the production to consider not using candlelight uh, during day scenes, and that you can motivate the light through the windows or or, or some other way. Uh, just simply because uh, I think after the first season they spent a lot of money on candles, <laughs> and so they, unless we really really needed them, they wanted to limit uh, the the usage, which then kind of is good in some ways because it it forces us to kind of figure out how to do things. Um, you know, the scene we just looked at is very very simple. It's it's uh, again uh, plenty of window sources. Um, you know, the choices sort of color choices that we can make. Uh, King's Landing obviously is warm, and so um, you know, uh, you know, I, I sort of motivate the light that way, but mixed in with some sort of cooler tones as well, um, partially to kind of also help uh, give contrast in the set design and the costume design, which of course are absolutely gorgeous uh, and a pleasure to work with uh, every day. Um, so it, it's just you know those simple choices that you make and and. Um, uh, you know, you go into the same set another another time. You usually, I mean, every Simon Harbor I think wants to try to do something a little different from what they did before. So um, it's a, it's always an, you know a, a journey that way. So, Fabian, can you say something about um, working with the production designers? Because um, there's quite a bunch of production designers, I'm sure, involved in uh, in creating this whole world of of Westeros and um, all the specific parts of it. Um, also there, you see also when the, the series is evolving that new things are being added and like the whole world like is rich and becomes richer and richer, I feel. Um, also including new locations, like you said, Spain. Um, how do you work with them or is there any way of, of you knowing in advance uh, or talking with production designers? Are you involved in that process of developing and creating that world? Uh, no, absolutely. I mean, we have one production designer, Deb Riley, who's fantastic. I think she also started season four. Um, I mean, all of us were very early on involved in designing new sets. Um, normally the way it works is that uh, Deb would design a set, uh, it would get sent off to David and Dan for an approval. If they like it, it comes back and then we all talk about it, we go down there with the director, we look at the set because obviously from our point of view, it's about the flexibility as much as it is about the look um, of the actual set. So, you know, we talk about, okay, are we going to be able to move this wall or can we maybe move that window slightly over there or maybe can we make the window slightly bigger so we can push the light in slightly further into the room. So there's a lot of factors that we consider um, before anything gets built. I mean, the great thing generally with Game of Thrones and the design is, and I think it's a huge part of the look of the show, is that, you know, I mean, I've done a lot of TV stuff in the UK, for example, and, you know, things are small, money isn't, you know, there's not that much money, obviously, so, you know, you shoot in, in you don't build the sets that much, you, you shoot more in uh, actual locations where there isn't any flexibility and it's smaller. The great thing with Game of Thrones is, is that anything you see, I mean, for example, that scene in the, in the um, audience chamber, it's a big set, you know, it's actually a huge set, so, you know, y you can afford to go big and wide, you can achieve those those big shots which set the show probably apart from other shows where you just don't have sets that are that big. Yeah. Um, going to another uh, quite uh, big scene at least, which is a, uh, a battle scene that you shot, uh, Fabian. Um, maybe we can watch the clip first and then you can say something about how that specific scene was set up, what of it uh, you were involved in, how much of it is also visual effects, uh, and so on. So we move to that topic slowly. Uh, let's see the fourth clip, please. <laughs> Tell us how you did it. No idea. Um, I mean, look, it's such a, you know, it's... 
there's so many people involved in, in the making of that show, and, and literally everyone is really playing on the top of the game. I mean, what I love about Game of Thrones and about you've got the mixture between those really intimate scenes, like we've just seen the one with that Jonathan did, you know, which is just two really good actors, and then we have the opportunity to do something like this, which is obviously, you know, a big battle scene. I mean, we were shooting this over two weeks, I think, uh, on a set that we built in, actually in Belf, in outside Belfast, in a quarry. Um, again, everything that you see is built for real. So, you know, for us, that's just incredible to have everything there for real. So we snowed in the whole area, pretty much, and then we just did top-ups and visual effects. Um, pretty much all the effects that you see, like the wind, the snow, that's all done for real. Um, so we have big wind machines with snow and, I mean, you know, obviously supplemented by visual effects when you need, when you need it. Um, when you come to shoot a sequence like this, it's really, it becomes much more about organizing the day, trying to be, you know, making sure that you can shoot all the shots that you need to make that sequence work. Um, so we were shooting four cameras pretty much constantly all the time. Um, because I really wanted to operate one. Because normally we don't operate on Game of Thrones. We, you know, we have two or four, um, two, two operators each for, for, for each crew. Um, and I really wanted to get operate. <laughs> so uh, we had four cameras and then, um, yeah, we just shot for two weeks. Um, we were shooting in November, so the lights, we were very tight for light. Um, I think I was there at five o'clock every morning in the dark and we were starting to go through the shots, planning what we were gonna do that day. And as soon as it became light enough, we started shooting uh, until four o'clock when it was pretty much dark. And then I went home and just planned the next day, um, you know, exactly what camera does what um, to get all those, all those beats. I think we had 50 stuntmen for two, two, um, two weeks and about 350 extras. So the whole scene, shooting the whole scene took two weeks? I think it was roughly about 15 days, yeah. And um, when it comes to visual effects, I mean, you said, okay, much of it, what we see when it comes to snow and wind and everything is, is, is real. Um, but when it comes to visual effects, because quite some of it is also visual effects, um, how do you work with the visual effects team? I mean, are they working on set? Are they, do you see what they plan to do? I mean, of course, you know what it will look like in the end, so you, you get familiar with that when you're shooting a new scene in, a, in the same location. But is it something you are involved in, you can see, and then also change or adapt during shooting, or is it something totally done at the end? No, absolutely. We were, again, we're, we're involved from the very beginning um, with the director. I mean, something like this sequence is we do a previous on the whole thing, um, which you need to do for several reasons. One, obviously, is because financially they need to know how much you know that sequence is going to cost, and then you can work towards most of the time making it cheaper rather than putting more money in. Um, so you need to do a previous f uh, for that, and then we all sit that together, really, and we go through the sequence, we talk about the shots that we want to do. Um, it's also, it helps everyone to know when you turn up on a day, what do we need for that day, you know, everybody knows. Um, I mean, our visual effects team, as Jonathan will confirm, I mean, you know, those guys have won the Emmy, I think, five years in a row, so they're really, um, one of the best teams you can get. And we all, we know them very well. We, we work together very, very well. Um, I mean, you know, special, uh, visual effects wise, obviously we've got things like the giant, um, who's actually a real guy. He's about seven foot something, I think. Um, so what we do is we, um, on when we shoot that sequence, we have a, a green stick, which is, I think, 15 feet high. So actors have an eye line to, to act against. And then we go on into the stage um, after the sequence is finished and we shoot, um, I think he's called James, I'm not sure, um, on a miniature stage. So we build miniature sets. Um, so let's say, for example, the, uh, where he breaks, breaks through the, um, um, the, the hut when he breaks out. We build the front part of that um, on a half scale model and he actually breaks through it and that, that then gets um, put into the um, final piece. Okay, we're gonna watch the last clip and um, then I'd like to, so you can start thinking already, uh, also give you the opportunity to start asking Jonathan and, uh, and Fabian some questions. The last scene 
Jonathan Shot by You um, is, I have to check, introducing um, another character we have not seen yet uh, so far today, uh, Cersei Lannister, um, talking with her brother. Um, maybe you can say something before we see this scene? Uh, really, there's not much to say other than it's, um, you know, a, a scene actually, again, I think it's in season three. Um, Tyrion's in his cell. He's been put there by his, his father, and uh, he's being visited by his, his uh, sister, um, Cersei. And it's, again, more, more as you were saying, uh, Fabian, the more uh, some of this, the strength of, of the show really is actually these two-handers between great actors with beautiful dialogue. So that's essentially what this scene's about. So. One question maybe before we watch that clip. Um, you both have been working a lot on serial formats, mini-series with different directors and so on. Uh, you've been awarded for like series. Is there a specific reason you're working on series? I mean, would you be interested in working on films as well? Or is there like it just happened that way and uh, that's how you like it? How's that with you, Jonathan? Um, well, for me, it's, it's about, I, I must say that I'm, I'm most intrigued by great writing and uh, that's the first thing that I uh, look for when I when I read a script. Um, it should go without saying, but I'm actually, you know, as a cinematographer, more interested in, in um, a story that's compelling, uh, characters that are compelling. Uh, the cinematography aspect of it and what I would like to con contribute to it is, is sort of secondary to it. So I'm drawn towards that, and uh, it just it seems that um, in the last. 10 years really, the quality of television writing has you know, gone through the roof. And uh, so my exposure to quality of writing is generally comes through television. And so even though I've done movies, um, I've, been, I've been selective of the movies that I've made. And you know, I uh, generally like the scripts of, of the movies I've made. But um, uh, if an opportunity comes by that's uh, a great script. If it's a television show, to me that it, it, it's not it's it's not as if I don't want to be a you know a, a, a film cinematographer. I just actually just at, the, at this stage right now uh, have had more um, opportunities for great uh, greatly written television shows. How's that for you, uh, Fabian? I think I think I feel the same. I mean, obviously, you know, I've grown up on watching movies and. Watching movies has always made me want to become a, a cinematographer, but you know, I've shot a couple of movies and I'm doing a movie next, which is great. But you know, like Jonathan says, I mean, TV has just become so, you know, it's changed so much. Uh, and now, you know, with shows, like, I mean, Jonathan has shot many more shows that are visually grand, you know, as well. I mean, Rome, for example. Um, you know, the stuff that you can do and the sets that you have, and if you look at, you know, Game of Thrones isn't really a typical TV show. It's, you know, it's opened up the, the world f between TV and, and film, really, so. Okay, let's watch the last clip. We have mics in the audience, and um, please raise your hand if you'd like to ask anything to Jonathan and or Fabian. Um, I'll know there's also people sitting on the two balconies, but I can't always see you because there's beautiful light here. So if you're sitting on the second balcony, welcome today as well. Uh, please give a shout. So we'll, uh, we'll make sure you get a mic too. I'll start downstairs and I'll start... the gentleman here in the front. Hello. Uh, I would like to ask you... Uh, I have an impression that you a little bit misused the... Um a technical, good technical characteristic of the current cameras, and sometimes you just not need, don't use the external illumination. It make really better picture, more natural. But uh, I think that still, even with the super contemporary, super good cameras, we still need uh, enough additional uh, lighting. Is that a question? And, yes, it's a question. Uh, it's a question. Uh, why you? Why they do you use that? Why they misuse? And which camera? I guess it was Sony F55. Uh, 
Actually, it's the Alexa that we, we've been using. Um, anyway, it's contemporary yeah. camera and have very high uh, sensitivity that should not be misused. That's right. It's, uh, it, we generally set it for 800 ASA, which is the recommended uh, ASA, which is a little bit more latitude than film. Um, I actually, I, the, originally, the show was, was being, being considered to be shot on film. And uh, I'm not sure exactly how it went through the process, but basically they decided to test the Alexa and the, uh, the two cinematographers that were in this first season was uh, Mon Mon uh, Marco Pontakova and uh, uh, Alex Zakharov. And after doing the test, they kind of were very impressed and decided that they were going to go that way. And I think it served our show quite well, um, particularly the amount of footage that we shoot. You couldn't shoot that show on, on film, I think. What's that? I don't think you could shoot that show on film. Yeah, no, I think it's a fair point. Uh, particularly, you know, the locations that we shoot, um, uh, just uh, and the turnover time that is required for post-production, just, you know, that's adding days, if not weeks, to uh, post-production, actually. Forget about the cost now. Um, so in the end, it was actually a fortuitous choice to, to make. Um, in terms of... Talking about the additional lighting, um, uh, it's true, but I guess in the case of, for, for our show, you know, I don't know how you would like to describe our look, if you will, but um, it's sort of expressionistic realism or some kind of bogus term like that, but it's, it's, it does require additional lighting to help shape it and give it, um, uh, a, I guess, a a, uh, a more dramatic look. So, I, I'm not sure if that answers your question, though. Yeah, so, so. We'll move on. Um, Fabian, do you want to add something to it, or you're fine and you'll come to it later on? Good. Here in the front, uh, two questions next to each other. Um, with different DOPs and art directors working on different seasons, um, how do you ensure visual um, consistency throughout the piece? I mean, like we said earlier, you know, if you're doing a series, you always have to be aware of consistency throughout the show. So, you know, the nice thing about Game of Thrones is that, you know, it's, it's been the same people really for a few years, so we all know each other very well. So, also, when you come in as a cinematographer into a series, you, you know, you come in knowing that you have to adhere to the look that's been set, unless production will change it, obviously. But, but you need to really follow a string that runs all the way through. So you can go in and we, we all do our own thing because obviously we're all very different, but overall we need to stick to the same, to the same look, really. And, and, you know, Game of Thrones, I mean, we have... I mean, first of all, we talk a lot. We all know each other very well, so there's a lot of collaboration between not only us, the piece, but also um, every other crew member. And um, we have systems, we have a system called Synchronize where, you know, everybody can look on... Uh, no, what's the other one called? Uh, well, there's pics. Yeah, it's pics. So we have pics, we use pics, which means um, all the rushes get put up every day. So I can look at Jonathan's rushes, he can look at my rushes. If I finish in the throne room um, for my episode and Jonathan takes it over in his episodes, he can look at my stuff or vice versa. So we always make sure that we, you know, it all fits together. Thank you. I have a question uh, referring again to film or um, video. For one, what is the frame rate that we are seeing here now? And is, is that something that, besides the look of film or versus video, is something that's still being dis discussed? Or uh, is, is that decided and the, the taste is assumed to have moved on? Uh, it's 24p, so it's 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 basically uh, matching sort of the film look. Um, uh, it, no, are you talking about the in terms of the show itself? Like we we obviously won't be considering going back to film, <laughs> but but what was your question? Right, so yeah. 60, uh, frame rate of 60 seconds, that's uh, 24, yeah. Right, but um, but uh, what what had been tried with the Hobbit or. That's not oh, as hard okay. as a as a 
new form of, of uh, visual aesthetics anymore, but we're back to 24p and we love it. Yeah, I, I guess um, that was an experiment. Uh, some people liked it, some, a lot of us didn't actually. Um, it just looked too crisp, too almost like bad video, honestly. Uh, but it was an experiment. I, I think it's always great to have these exper experiments. Uh, uh, but in a show like this, you know, obviously, you know, we're sticking with what we, we've done in the past, and uh, I don't think we'll, season six is 3D, I can tell you that much. <laughs> no, and I think that the format that they've been shooting on and the, the way they've been working it for the past five years, I mean, it proves to be successful to production and to post-production, and it works for us on set, so there's no reason to change that. And you know, also, I mean, some of the scenes, like if you look at a hard home, for example, you know, you're shooting four cameras for two weeks, and you're constantly shooting, shooting, shooting. I mean, if you were shooting that on film, you would roll through so much film. For, for a TV show that has such a quick turnaround, plus all these visual effects, plus for us to be able to see what each other does, yeah. shooting digitally just means you have a lot more um, freedom, really, in that sense. Moving on to the end of the room there, and then we go to the middle here, the gentleman, and then we're going upstairs. Um, hi. <coughs> Fabian, I was wondering if you could uh, tell me a little bit about the role of the DIT on Game of Thrones, please. So, yeah, where, where, where were you? I can't see you. I mean, the DITs for us are hugely important on Game of Thrones. We were very lucky to have some of the best DITs, I would say. Um, you know, we, I mean, shooting digitally especially and shooting fast because we do have to shoot fast in Game of Thrones. It's not like we have a lot of time. You really have to, you're pretty much shooting all day and you have to turn over quickly, not only because of the amount of stuff that we have to shoot, but also you want to give the directors as much time as possible with the, with the actors. Um, so the DRTs play a huge part and, uh, you know, they've, we had the same guys really for the past few years which is great because you build up a relationship. You, you know, they're very creative, which for me is always um, the most important thing. You know, technically, that's one thing, but the creativity, I think, is really important. And I mean, f for us, when I work with them, it's really a dialogue between the DRT and me, and we talk about certain ideas. And, you know, it's nice to have that relationship because, you know, they're honest with me sometimes, and they tell me, no, I don't think that's right. I think you should probably, you know? So it's nice to have that relationship. They're a massive part of, of that crew. A question in the middle here, gentlemen. Um, we all know that uh, this kind of series, it's much more producer-driven than director-driven. I mean, directors come and go, cinematographers come and go, producers stay. My question is, how do you cope with getting the, the feel of every scene? How much liberty do you have to do your own coverage? Or do you, are, are you submitted or are you given kind of directions, do that, do that? I mean, more camera moves in this episode or um, more individual shots. How, how does it go? That's one part of the question. And the other part of the question, a part of the fight scenes, you said you operate. Do you use two or three cameras on actor scenes on, on sets? And then how do you work with the other operator, operators, if you? Two questions, maybe you start? Well, I guess, uh, right, the one uh, involved. OK. Um, uh, yeah, in terms of, of uh, dictation of coverage and whatnot. It's actually the directors that they do bring up aboard really are um, respected in terms of, of their visions. Um, and so uh, unlike your standard TV show um, where uh, I guess the tradition is that you know the, the writer and, uh, and is often a producer and of course shares uh, has the vision to, to implement and as you say Directors, DPs kind of go through the cycle, and then there's usually a mandate. This is a kind of a show that's quite different, specific, in particular where we shoot it, as we mentioned before, that you have these teams of uh, uh, director, DP, AD, as if it was almost shooting a movie. 
the there are certain I guess since it's a traditional show, I guess I guess the simplest way to describe it, there's certain um, uh, over stylized elements that will kind of be maybe rejected, if you will. Um, but usually we'll have enough time to review it, so it's not a surprise on the day. The concession might be a director or a cinematographer might have an idea. If we haven't shot a test, if we have the time, we might do a version that would then be, as long as we shoot a safe version, then the, you know, then uh, we can experiment a little bit more. But, um, but there is a lot of great uh, respect for the directors, as there should be. And these are really phenomenal directors that are on the show. And, uh, the great thing about our uh, team, essentially, is that it's, it's a mutual respect. Um, uh, but particularly for us, I think, as uh, people involved, the producers of the show are phenomenal. They're the most amazing producers that I've ever worked with. Um, just on the complexity of the project, uh, how daunting it is, and yet how they treat everybody with respect as well. And uh, a real pleasure to work with. So that's the produ producerial question, I guess you're, you can answer the camera. Um, this man has taught me a lot, by the way, years ago. Um, <laughs> I'll, come, I'll come back. Um, I guess, yeah, like, I mean, you know, everybody is very respectful of the look of the show, so everybody knows, you know, compositionally and how the show works and what the show is meant to be. Um, it happens sometimes that, you know, you come up with an idea which doesn't quite work and they tell you off. I've done one such mistake, uh, I think on season five, where, you know, the director and I looked at the scene and we thought, wow, this is a great opportunity to shoot the scene a certain way, which is what we did. And, you know, our, our camera operators have been on the show for a long, long time. Uh, so our relationship is very close and they're very good good operators and, and, you know, I sort of double checked with them both and said, you know, do you think this, we should do it this way? It's a little bit out of the Game of Thrones style. And they said, yeah, I think this really works for the scene. So we shot it and, you know, we, were, we finished the day early, I think, we had a great day. And um, the first thing that happened when I was sitting in the pub with a pint thinking, what a great day, I had a phone call from the two producers saying, what the hell are you doing? This is not what we're doing on the show. Why did you shoot it that way? And uh, they actually made us reshoot the whole day. <laughs> in the end, it was a good thing because it turned out to be a better scene. But um, so, you know, you just have to find that the right way sometimes. And because Game of Thrones, because it, it has an established look, you know, you can't go away from it too much, but you can always try and, you know, go into a little bit of a different direction. Just, you just have to be careful of how much you go. <laughs> and camera operators, like I just said, you know, they, those guys have been doing it for a long time. Um, they're very established operators. They've also so become they, friends. They stay and work with different cinematographers, basically. They are the same operators. Yes, so, so basically we have two crews. We've got the Dragon crew and the Wolf crew. They both consist of a whole crew. It's, it's two full crews. Each crew has two camera operators, all the assistants, one gaffer, all the sparks, uh, art, the art department, everything, props. and. Um, us as, as the director, DP, AD team, we go in between. So I might shoot, you know, if we're shooting in, in Belfast, Jonathan might be in the studio with the Dragon crew, and maybe I'm in location on the same day with the Wolf crew. And then a couple of days later, we swap or some other team comes in. Okay, we're moving on. Um, I'm going to have a look at the balcony. There's two questions I see, so let's take the two questions from the first balcony. Start there. Uh, you've shot in a lot of um, harsh climates, Iceland, for example. Uh, how do you take that into account? Were there stuff you uh, wanted to do that you just couldn't do because of limitations? Um, well, it, I, th I think the limitations are always one of those things where, like, particularly Iceland, which I had the fortune to, I think, shoot all three seasons there, and I had been there many times before, actually as a, just a, as a visitor, and, and uh, so the limitations, of course, when you shoot in the winter there, of course, the light is, is very little light. You might have seven hours at most, maybe six and a half, really, 
of, of light. Uh, so it's scheduled reasonably, but we do have to keep everything relatively simple. So um, particularly some of these locations are hard to get to. They're potentially dangerous, uh, not easy footing. So um, it's all pre-planned ahead of time. Um, and, uh, you know, it, the weather itself is just, you know, you can't do anything about it. And there's been numerous times where we would scout a location, you know, clear day, beautiful background, you know, we're going to sit back this way because of the mountain range and the, in the vista, you know, the difference, you know, it's just a beautiful, perfect way to frame it. And uh, sure enough, you get there and it's a complete whiteout. So, you know, uh, you have to kind of assume the worst sometimes um, and uh, hope for the best, really. And, and just to add to that, um, that's another great thing about producers on this show is that, or every, everyone really, is that they really, I mean, they really listen to us, I think. You know, if, you know, if in what direction we think would be to shoot best or, you know, that there's a lot of thought for that. Or Plus, all the weather, yeah, absolutely. And, um, and you can see that all the way through. I mean, I was going to say that earlier, you know, it's the only show I've ever done for TV where in the color grade at the end, for example, they don't make it brighter, but they actually make it darker, yeah. which is, for us, is a great thing. I mean, I've done so many shows where, you know, you sit in the, I can't attend the grade, and then I watch it later and I think this is not what it was meant to be. On this show, they really, they listen to that. They know how important visuals are, and they really, they try to really put that all the way through. Good, moving on. There's another question here in the front of the balcony. Hello. Uh, since the show became an even bigger success during the last years, can you tell us how, I mean, four cameras seems legit at this budget, but can you tell us how this ch your work changed from the pilot through the six years we're now in, in terms of artistic freedom? Um, well, I, I think in terms of uh, the, the number of cameras, it's pretty much stayed the same. Uh, although, as, as Fabian mentioned, certain sequences, like an action sequence, the brilliant action sequence of Hard Home, uh, required multiple cameras. Um, but in general, we, we tend to work with just two cameras. And, and also, we don't necessarily shoot two cameras simultaneously all the time. It's a choice by the director and or some photographer, depending uh, how you utilize that team. And I've, you know, uh, often with some of the directors used uh, very much in a cinematic way where you just have one camera doing one thing and instead of trying to stick another camera in there for a lesser quality shot, uh, it's being set up for another shot. So there's always, um, you know, time saving and leapfrogging, but it's not necessarily at the compromise of the of the shots necessarily. Um, and do you want to add to it? Or? No. no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, a third question from upstairs. You do. Uh, that, that just reminds me of a funny story because you do get sometimes directors who want to push it a little bit further. With we've got we, we have this very small set which is a cell, and I was shooting in there last year with two cam. And my director really wanted to have two cameras in there, which was a real nightmare because it's a tiny space. I mean, it's just. And then so I had a bit of a, of a really annoying day, and then at the end, the next day, I found out that. Robert Lackland, one of our other DPs, was in the same set the next day, and his director made him put three cameras into that <laughs> set. So I thought, okay, well, I got away lightly. Okay. Go ahead. Hello. Um, congratulations to this great work, the first. And then um, to come to the real creator of it all, of this world, George R. R. Martin. Is there any involvement in the visual terms of the show by him or advices or was there a meeting with you and him 
I know he did in the first show, he was involved in creating several links. I had the opportunity to meet him once and talk with him about it, but how is there any, because he also comes from television and film working, was there a work together? Um, there was no um, obvious uh, blueprint from George regarding the visual look of the show, but certainly it was more related to his story and character arcs and obviously trying to select from the vast amazing material uh, to tell the stories as much as we could in, in, uh, on a, a TV show, basically. But that was really between him, himself and, and uh, Dan and David. Um, but in terms of a visual look, it's, it's, he's written it, actually. I mean, in the sense that the settings that are there, even though I, I only read the first book, but uh, his writing is so vivid and so specific that you can't help uh, feeling that even on a script, even if you haven't read the books. So in a way, he has influenced it just by the nature of, of the, the incredible variety of, of, of landscapes and worlds that he's created. So. So you're not personally approved by George R. R. Martin before you could start working on the show? Um, we, I haven't got a note from him yet, so... <laughs> I think he's only been on set once yeah. as well, so he's not, he doesn't really yeah. come to set. Yeah. I, think, I think he came in season two once. That's right, yeah. yeah. He has no time anymore because he has to write uh, new novels now anyway. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> okay, let's move to the third balcony. Please make a bit of a sound. Anybody with a question up there? I don't hear anything, so I move here. I can see one. Uh, question to we'll come back. A uh, question to you, Fabian Wagner, uh, regarding Sherlock, uh, because there was a lot of talk about the 5D in regards to Sherlock. Um, is there, in any episode of Sherlock that you shot, uh, auch nur a single frame of bewegt bild that has been shot and captured with the 5D, or is that only used for the closes, for the stills? Uh, as in, is, is there any other moving pictures in the, in, the, in, the, in the final piece, rather than just the stills? Exactly, uh, a, a piece of a moving image actually captured with the 5D, or, or is that 5D, 5D only used for no, the stills, no. for the closes? Uh, that's a really good, so, such a long time ago. I think I threw everything in there that, was, that I had. I think there's a GoPro in there. I think there's definitely 5D. There's also, also in the moving image material. Yeah, I think, I think all the stuff that's on the laptop when he's talking to Sherlock, when they find the body, I think all oh, that's 5D. But I'm not, I'm not quite, I'm not that sure anymore. Uh, what was the main camera that you used for shooting the shot? Sherlock was on the Alexa as well. Okay, another chance for upstairs. If you have a mic in your hand, please ask the question. Hello? Oh, yes, uh, bringing it back to Game of Thrones. Uh, I was wondering how closely you work with the choreographers of the action scenes, and also just like on average for an average scene, average scene how many takes you would do? Uh, again, I mean, takes to it totally depends on the scene, the, take, the amount of takes, and it depends on, you know, how quickly we get there. Um, I think it's very hard to put a, a, you know, a number on the takes. We don't do that many be simply because there isn't that much time. I mean, you just have to move on. Um, and the actors are so good, you know, that you don't really need that, that many takes. I always love to have a few takes because I take the first take to tweak. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, I think I generally I would, I would probably say maybe three, three, four takes, but I don't think it's... Yeah, I mean, they, first of all, the actors are so spot on that in some ways you have to assume that you are only going to end a couple takes, not because they won't give it to you, but we, as Vivian said, we don't really have the time. And, uh, and so um, it's really limited to that. And, you know, uh, a lot of these scenes are long scenes, actually, the, depending on what they are. Um, even the two-handers can be a six-page scene or more complicated sequences uh, in terms of basic coverage. But, um, you know, the way it's scheduled, we, you know, 
because of the limited amount of time, I don't, w w there's no uh, opportunity to really uh, overshoot it, basically. It, we have to be pretty precise on, in terms of how we cover things, generally. The question, I mean, is there any particular episode that you have very fond memories of because of, I don't know, like the setting, the preparation, something unexpected that happened and you were able to, to uh, turn into a way that you maybe did not expect at all. Is there anything where you feel like, well, that was really, really a great shoot? It might also be a scene? I mean, I think for me personally, it's, I would say it's probably hard home just because it was so freaking hard. Um, to shoot that, and I still can't believe that we actually managed to get all these beats that we had to get. Um, I think that's, yeah, you know, and it was also, I mean, I, you know, it was such a fun shoot, you know, I, I had a great time during those um, two weeks. So. But it's, it, every, every, you know, it's like Jonathan said before, you know, the, it, it's so nice to work with a good script and really good actors, and sometimes if you do a scene in Game of Thrones, which is just between two actors, who are really playing off each other with great dialogue, that's just as much fun, so. Yeah, and, and actually also that you, you were there the, as the first witness or the first audience, really, uh, on a performance, and sometimes even the, the writing, you don't, you kind of, it's an interesting scene, but you don't necessarily get the significance of the scene until you see the, actually the performance. And then so, that, those are some of my experiences where a scene initially, when I read it, was, which you know, kind of interesting, and then it became something more uh, after the the uh, the actors got their hands on it. And so, but I can't say for myself that there's any particular episode or um, essence. I mean, really, for me, it's just the uh, it's the overall when I step back and, and realize, you know, uh, how fortunate I feel to be able to work with all these great people and. and uh, be involved in such a great story. So. What was the first scene you, you shot for Game of Thrones? Do you remember that? Or the first episode? Uh, You've done quite some oh, season. Uh, yeah, it was, it was kind of a bit, bit strange. It was, uh, I was flown in to sort of get uh, the lay of the land. I wasn't, you know, supposed to, was like, this was about a month before I was actually officially to start. And um, I had just landed and literally, you know, I was a bit groggy from jet lag. And they said, oh, by the way, do you mind shooting the scene tomorrow? Uh, it's uh, I th a scene, um, oh, is it, it was a, uh, I've forgotten the, the character's names already. Um, uh, it's in uh, Dragonstone um, with uh, oh, Stannis and, and um, uh, the other guy. The, the, no, the, 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 the woman. Um, oh, the red, the, the red, yeah, the red yeah. woman, basically. Uh, and you know, it's just a night scene again, hand, you know, two-hander. But but you know, I'd I'd never obviously worked with anybody, and uh, and so I had to uh, uh, sort of adapt myself very quickly to it. But it was fine. It was... Moving back to you guys here. Okay, we start here in the front in the corner. Hi there. Are there any particular films or television series that you guys watched like growing up that really inspired or informed the way you approach cinematography? <laughs> That's the most impossible question to just, answer. Just name a few, like, just, I'll, just a, like, a little few. Um, okay, I'll start. There you go. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I would say Storaro was probably my biggest influence, um, just because he, uh, I don't know, he's, for some reason his work was so profoundly uh, striking and, and, and unusual, um, particularly 1900, which I think is his best film. Um, uh, just the way in which his light was naturalistic but expressionistic, again, Sort of somewhat pretentious term, but it's the only way I can describe it. It's sort of like if you had a. It was interesting because I always thought, you know, his sunsets, for example, were really saturated orange sunsets, and the the cool tones in in the shadows were very very cool, and is very um, 
uh, amplified in some way. So, but at the same time, the, the contrast ratio, the quality of light was still representative of something being, being of the light being very realistic. And yet you know he's lighting it. So it was one of those things where I was really moved by and, and really influenced by. Um, and and I, I remember early on as a cinematographer, I'd always ask, how would Vittorio do this scene? <laughs> of course, <laughs> having no idea how I'd do it. Um, but so, yeah, I, I would say he was probably a great influence. Um, but, you, you know, there are so many cinematographers and so many films that uh, are inspirational. P forget about art, um, music, all these other things that are incredibly important as a cinematographer, I think. So. Next question, here in the middle. Maybe we can have two mics already going because they can try to get another like four to five questions before we have to wrap up. Hello, uh, I currently study film at the Fabian Soul School actually. And I was wondering uh, what kind of advice do you have to give to young cinematographers, both of you? I mean, look, it's, just, it's, it's always a tricky question to answer, but I think in general, I think from what I've learned over the years, I mean, you know, you just have to work, be prepared to work very hard. If you want to go into film, I think you just have to love what you do. You have to love working in the industry, and it is a great industry to work in. So just, I think just enjoying doing it and um, shooting as much as you can. The more you shoot, the more mistakes you make. And only by making mistakes is when you learn. And I, I just, I always believe that, you know, you make your own luck, so, you know, and you need a lot of luck in this industry. You have to meet the right people at the right time, uh, maybe, or for your show to come out at the right time, for example. Um, now, my perfect example, for example, is Sherlock, you know, that for me, that show, I got onto that show by luck, basically. I didn't really know the director. I got the show, I got the interview, I was good enough in the interview to get the job, and then, you know, the timing was perfect, and it went down very well, and that, you know, opened up new doors. So I think, I think just, you know, just be yourself, be, you know, learn as much as you can every day. You can shoot stuff every day. It doesn't matter what camera you use. I, I talk to a lot of students now, and, and everybody's always complaining about, oh, we don't have an Alexa at the film school, or we don't have a, we don't shoot Super 16 anymore. It's not about the format. It's about getting comfortable with a camera or with camera operating, for example. And it doesn't matter what camera you operate, it's doing it is going to make you better. So it's kind of sometimes, I think, these days, just leaving those idealistic ideas behind and just using what you have and just taking advantage of that. And always surround yourself with people that push you and that you can push. And that's going to help you a lot as well. That sounds great. You want anything to add to that, Jonathan, or shall we move on with the next question? No, I think that sounds like a perfect answer to me. Uh, two questions here, maybe two mics straight away, so we can like put a little bit quicker one after the other. There's another question here, maybe the second mic. Okay, hi. Um, I would like to know how you choose who is going to shoot which scene. Do you get assigned to special sh scenes because from what we saw it doesn't look like maybe Fabian always shoots in the north or always does scenes with the character Daenerys but both of you do that so how do you or maybe do you sometimes read the script and go I really want to do that scene or is it assigned to you? Um, it's pretty much assigned to you so I mean, it's like I was saying before um, the, the great thing about doing the show is, is that you go in and you know you're going to be shooting these two episodes, and usually they're connected ep episodes. This is, this is really what's happened in the last couple of years. I mean, before that, there'd be occasional time where you'd only do one episode, or, or, uh, some probably may come in and just do one episode, or what have you, and same with the director. But generally speaking, you have a two-hour uh, story to tell, and again, you're working with the director and the AD together to tell that story. And you travel to all those locations uh, or those set pieces 
as, as if you, it was your own film. So that's one of the, the probably the most effective ways of re retaining consistency throughout the episode or episodes. Um, the bigger arc is, a, is another question, but that's more related to communication between cinematographers. Uh, you know, I don't know how much the directors communicate with each other, but the cinematographers do quite a bit. Um, and it's through that process we talked about. So um, it, certainly there are times where, you know, you're reading the episodes of someone else's uh, scenes and you go, ah, I want to do that scene. <laughs> but, uh, you know, again, it's more sort of like uh, being in the, a candy store and selecting, you know, you know, getting what you get, but it's pretty, pretty great candy regardless, so. Go ahead. Um, which do you prefer doing in terms of television drama? A series that you are DOPing every episode of like you did with Sherlock, or just coming in for the odd couple of episodes with like Game of Thrones? I mean, Sherlock's a little bit different because Sherlock was three 90-minute movies, so. I, I, I mean, personally, I would never want to do um, 10 episodes of one season. I mean, first, on Game of Thrones, that would be totally impossible anyway, just dictated by the way that we shoot it, but also it would just be way too much for one person to, to shoot. Uh, and, you know, the great thing is, for someone like me, you know, I'm very lucky to be working with someone like Jonathan, you know? I mean, so it's a great, you know, I mean, I've learned a lot from Jonathan, and, you know, it's so, it's, it's amazing to have the opportunity to be able to exchange ideas and to talk about things and, you know, so I would, I mean, I know, I know, I know a guy who's just shot a uh, whole 10 episodes on something and, I mean, first of all, he's totally knackered and he's probably not going to get out of bed for two months. Yeah. Um, it's, I think it's just too much, you know, it means you can't prep properly, it means, you know, it just becomes a sausage factory that I don't really want to do anyway. One last question we have time for, and... I've got the microphone. <laughs> so, <ahead>. um, just... <laughs> Thank you. So, just uh, one question. How is your communication with your gaffer? So, is it like, um, we need a butterfly here, or is it like, um, I don't know, it's 12 o'clock in the midday, and light what you want? Um, I think we're all the cinematographers on the show are, are pretty specific about what they need. Uh, that's not to say that the, our gaffers do make recommendations for alternative choices, because either for practical reasons or what's more efficient. Um, but in general, uh, we're all pretty very specific about what we need. It's, it becomes interesting when, if we're sharing a stage set, for example, uh, one cinematographer will come in and, you know, they essentially get it pre-lit, uh, generally for what they need, but that's where the communication is very important because depending on how quickly the turnaround is, if there's not enough turnaround, we might have to, uh, you know, we usually communicate with each other to make sure that if we can, that at least instruments will be ready for when the next cinematographer comes in. It doesn't always happen, you know, there's been some nicking of of equipment occasionally, but, but it, it's, uh, it's important uh, communication between the gaffer and, and the, the DOP. So. Uh, a show that has so much to do with power and with characters ranging from two or three meters high to uh, Tyrion Lannister, how do you retain who has the power in the scenes when you shoot them? Uh, no idea. N we we don't. I don't think we necessarily uh, consciously uh, think that way. It's just sort of what what seems to be what would feel right. And I would imagine subconsciously the director and the DOP would, if they want to give that impression, might lower the camera or whatnot. But it's generally more of just a uh, more of a stylistic choice uh, of framing that as opposed to being, uh, taking it literally, I guess. Um, it, there's just some simple aspects, you know. Um, you know, when you frame a giant, you have to frame, make sure that they're in the frame. So, it, simple things like that, uh, where you need to help tell the story of how big that, that giant is, is more of a, 
a, a process of figuring out how you, you frame something within the frame to tell, to give that impression, but actual emotional power or, or uh, that kind of thing is, is something that's it's a pretty subtle thing for us. So. It also happens, I think, subconsciously when you line up a shot and then it only comes across later when you see the shot in combination with the music, for example, or whatever is around it that makes it much more deliberate. So this was a session not only about um, shooting and uh, working on cinematography for a series, but also um, we learned that uh, it's good to work a lot and make a lot of mistakes because that's the best way to work, to surround yourself with people who can push you, to work with great teams and to be able to learn from each other. And last but not least, also uh, to shoot and be able at the same time to reduce candles when shooting. <laughs> thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you very much, Fabian.